One man's family is dedicated to the proposition that the American family is the bulwark of the American nation, and that so long as family life as we know it thrives, this America will be a good place in which to live. Our story deals with the family of Henry and Fanny Barber, they themselves, their children, and their grandchildren. You're not going to meet all the family today, because, my goodness, there are 12 grandchildren alone, including one set of triplets and one set of twins. But you are going to meet some of the more important members. And to begin with, here is father, Henry Barber himself, a retired stock and bond broker, a man with a truly green thumb in his garden, and a great advocate of the American family way of life, Father Barber. Yes, yes. The good family, the happy child-parental relationship, is the true solution to most of the problems in the world today. When homes are loose and slipshod and parents are selfish and inattentive, there you will find juvenile delinquency, bad citizenship, and bad parents for the next generation. If we have an inordinate divorce rate today, then follow the trail back and you will find the reason in the homes of the generation before. If I were to tell you... Now, Henry, that will do. Uh, oh, Fanny, I've just begun. And it's all very good, but this is not the time and place to say it. <laughs> well, as you may surmise, that was Fanny Barber, the mother of the five Barber children and the grandmother of the 12 members of the younger generation. Please go right ahead, Mrs. Barber. I am very proud of my five sons and daughters. My eldest son, Paul, is my wise son and a strong right arm to the whole family. I'd like to introduce you to Paul. You know, he married in the First World War and lost his wife almost immediately afterwards. He's never married since and lives at home with his father and me. Come here, Paul. Ah, uh, yes. The fond mother. <laughs> Is that all you have to say? Well, I might say this. Living as I do at the top of the family home in a studio of my own, I seem to be up where I am able to look out over the whole family and get a pretty fair perspective of family life and family relations. And maybe this sometimes gives me the opportunity of untangling a domestic snarl which those closer to it are unable to divine. Yes, Paul, I think it does. Introduce Hazel next, don't you think? Yes. Come here, Hazel. This is my eldest sister. She is now the wife of Daniel Murray, and they and their three youngsters live just three blocks down and two blocks over from the family home. Hazel, what do you have to say for yourself? I just want to mention that I'm sorry that my husband, Daniel, isn't here on this occasion, but he's up at Sky Ranch today. And my three children, Hank and Pinky, the twins, and Margaret, my young daughter, at school. But you'll meet them all in the right time and right place, no doubt. Thank you, Hazel. Now, Claudia, she and Clifford were born twins, too. Yes, they run in the family, apparently. You'll meet Clifford in a moment, but first Claudia, or rather, Mrs. Nicholas Lacey. She and her husband live six blocks straight down from the family home. <laughs> we certainly do, Paul. I suppose I should apologize also for not having my husband, Nicky, here, too. But like Hazel's Daniel, Nicky likewise is up at the Sky Ranch. And my youngest daughter, Penelope, and Cliff's young son, Skippy, who's like a son to Nicky and me, are at school, too. However, Joan's here. Joan's my 16-year-old daughter. Hi. I mean, Natch, I'm here. After all, where would a practically grown-up daughter be if not right in the middle of things? You know, sometimes I think it's a great big old hairy deal the way grown-ups try to push growing daughters around. But as long as it all comes all out right in the end, I guess it's okay. <laughs> well, that's quite a speech. Yeah, well, isn't it? All right, now Claudia's twin, Clifford. Cliff's been married twice and has lost both wives. His first wife gave him one son, Skippy, who now has become a permanent part of Claudia and Nikki's family. Cliff hasn't getting along so well of late. With himself or with the family? Is that anybody's business but my own? For Pete's sake, Paul, does everyone all the time have to be throwing it up in my face? I suppose it's my fault I'm not a better father to Skippy. I suppose it's my now, fault. please, Cliff. Well, you started it. I didn't. I'm sorry. Well, okay. Family, family, all the time up to your armpits and family. Yes, I'm sorry about that. But as I say, that's Cliff at the moment. Now, my youngest brother is Jack. He just amazed himself and the rest of the family recently by cooperating with his wife, Betty, in producing triplets. Jack, what about that? <laughs> That's right. Abby, Debbie, and Connie. Abigail, Deborah, and Constance, Jack. Okay, if you want to be formal about it. Oh, yeah, this is my wife, Betty. Hi. Don't forget our three older daughters. How can you possibly forget them? She's talking about Elizabeth, Sharon, Ann, six, Janie, four, and Mary Lou, two. The triplets are just new. Hardly used at all. <laughs> Silly. Well, that's the Barber clan in the main... There are others whom you will know and get to like as much as the family themselves, but I think this is enough for now. Hmm? 
Thank you, Paul. And now, will you please play Episode 7, Book 69, as a typical example of a chapter out of the lives of one man's family. Then try Episode 13, which jumps eight chapters to give you a later preview of events to come. Thank you. One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present Chapter 7, Book 69, entitled Triplets and Redheads. Jack and Betty are living temporarily with their triplets, plus E, Sharon, Ann, Mary Lou, and Janie. There's something doing every minute. Listen. Yeah, see what I mean? That's what is known as unison crying, and the triplets do it very well from time to time. Huh, unison crying. I suppose that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> well, anyway, here it is fairly late in the afternoon up on the second floor of the family home in Mother Barber's sewing room. Betty's there, and so is 16-year-old Joan from Nikki and Claudia. Can you imagine that, Joan, making fun of the triplets? Well, Betty, I didn't. Of course not, honey. Did you say you came over with your mother? Yes, but Claudia went on up to the top of the house to see Paul. Oh, that's it. Isn't Grandmother around? This is her afternoon at the sewing circle. She'll be home pretty soon, though. <laughs> you look like you had a sewing circle of your own. Oh, I'm just sewing up some rips in the three older girls' dresses. Well, I'd help, only I'm really lousy with a needle and thread. So was I when I married Jack. But you'll learn. Oh, I wouldn't. Oh, sure you would. When you got her, you got her. That's what I can't stand. Anything you have to do. But, Joan, that's all life is. Doing things that have to be done. Well, that's awful. No, it isn't. Not really. It's a challenge. What good is it to be alive if you're not worth anything? I mean, just sitting around breathing up the air and eating up the food and doing nothing in return is sheer waste. Waste of good air and good food, huh? Sure it is. People who don't pull their share are just a burden and in the way. But there are plenty of things in the world to do that you enjoy doing without being stuck with hateful things. No, it's just a little girl talking. You think I'm a little girl? Oh, no, not in lots of ways. You've got a gorgeous figure, and every time I look in your face, I feel... Oh, rather like an insignificant small-town girl compared to you. Really? I make you feel that way? Uh-huh, just like Claudia always has. But if I'm all that, why did you say little girl when I said there were plenty of things to do, leaving out the disagreeable ones? There's a disagreeable side to the very best a girl can hope for. Oh, I don't know. What about being a rich man's wife? Well, you want you to do things you won't like doing. Well, just suppose I find a rich man who'll let me do what I want to all the time. <laughs> there ain't no such critters. Okay, maybe I'll have a business career then. Oh, golly. You think husbands are hard to get along with, you should see a boss. Well, I'd get a boss who liked me. No boss likes a girl in his office unless she's good at her job. A girl may be the prettiest thing in sweater and skirt. She'll get blasted to kingdom come a hundred times a day if she can't do her job. Well, there must be some place in the world where a person can do what he wants to do and be what he wants to be. Maybe you think being an old maid would be fun. Well, if I can do what I want to do. <laughs> That's just cutting off your nose to spite your face. I'd rather be the very meekest of housewives with a man to hold me in his arms in the dark hours of the night than be the smartest, most glamorous, most independent female in the world with that small, gnawing fear of loneliness in the dark with the knowledge that nobody cared. Maybe you're the wifely type. <laughs> All women are the wifely type. Women need men just exactly as much as men need women. That's the one thing I keep praying for with our six daughters. Happy marriage for each. Believe me, I'm not just sitting down praying, either. I'm doing my doggondest to mold them into girls who will be lovable and desirable, and who in turn can accept love and modify their lives to include a man when the right one comes along. You really believe in marriage, don't you? You bet I do. And it's just cheap, smart talk to say anything else. Hello, Betty. There he is. In Mother Barbie's sewing room, Jack. We'll talk some more, Joan, if you like. Mm, yes, I'd like to. Maybe I've been missing something I didn't know about. Hey, look what I've got. <laughs> Oh, oh, one of the triplets. Hey, who's that? You mean to say you don't recognize Miss Abigail, honey? Not unless I look at the dog tag on her ankle. How are you, Miss Abigail, honey? Miss Abigail, honey, this is your cousin Joan. What do you call her? Miss Abigail, honey, that's something Nicoletta's added. We now have Miss Abigail, honey, Miss Deborah, honey, and Miss Constance, honey. <laughs> oh, you don't say so. Well, you don't have to bubble, do you? Of course she has to bubble, don't you, Abby? <laughs> Boy, have you got a wet kisser. 
Here, let me wipe your lips. Oh, oh be careful, Jack. Anyway, what are you doing home from the office at this time in the afternoon? On a slow day, so I drop by to see how my little family's doing. Huh. Little family, he says. Uh-huh. Would you like to hold Abby, Joan? Oh, is, is it okay? Oh, sure. Put the blanket under you, Jack. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget the blanket and rubber sheet. Oh, really? There you are. Hi. <laughs> oh, she's drooling again. Here, I'll wipe her mouth. <laughs> Abby of the wet kisser. Jack, don't say that. Oh, that's nothing to what the boys will say. Uh-oh, here comes wet smack Abigail. <laughs> Jack, that's horrible. <laughs> hey, Abby, don't encourage your father. Hmm, she isn't. She just likes her cousin Joan. And I like her. You do? Uh-huh. Slick chick. Aren't you, Miss Abigail? Uh, honey? Well, what's going on in here? Hi, Dan. Come on in, Father Barber. I'm on my way up to see Paul. Claudia's up there right now. No, oh, I didn't see you, Joan. Well, how are you, Jack? Oh, fine. Do you know which one of your new granddaughters I'm holding? Huh? Yes, it's Abigail, of course. Barbara, how did you know? Of course I know my grandchildren. That's some kind of shenanigan, Dad. Even Betty and I can't tell for sure yet. Uh, it is Abigail, isn't it? Yeah, sure. That's wonderful. How do you do it? Simplest thing in the world. Well, tell us. I have no intention of telling. Fine couple of parents who can't distinguish their children. Here, Joan, let me take Abby. Careful, Dad. Uh, don't always be saying careful to me. Come on, Abby, child. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, cheerful countenance, young lady. Bright and cheerful. I'm the one who can tell you about <laughs> Abby, Abby, this is your grandfather. Here, Dad, you better give her back to me. Here, I'll take her. That's it. Tragedy. Utter tragedy. Turned against by my triplet grandchildren. Give them a little while, Father Barber. Sure, they'll be eating out of your hand in no time. Tragedy. I've lived all these years a greatly admired man, only to be scorned in my twilight years by my own flesh and blood. Don't go away, Mary. I'll go up and get psychoanalyzed by Paul. That's what I do. Paul, are you in there? Uh Oh, our father. Come on in, Dad. Don't stand on ceremony. Yes. Oh, you too, Claudia. Sure. Come join the conclave. Paul provides all the comforts of home for his guests. Ah, George, Paul, all those women down on the second floor are completely spoiling those cigarettes. Oh, here, sit down. What's happened now? Why, I can't touch one of those youngsters without her setting up such a yowling. You'd think I was murdering her before the very eyes. <laughs> poor dad. Yeah, poor dad, indeed. <laughs> I'll have you know that Abby, Debbie, and Connie are being completely ruined before they're a month old. And to what do you attribute their ruination? Oop, obvious, perfectly obvious. Namely? Women. Women? <laughs> Women. Well, you'll have to be a little more explicit. Women to the right of them, women to the left of them, women morning, noon, and night. No wonder they don't behave themselves in the presence of their grandfather. Men are strange, frightening objects. All they know is women. That's a doggone ingenious theory. May I be the first to congratulate and you? And none of your flippancy, young man. <laughs> but there are not so many women. <laughs> what are you talking about? The mother, Betty, to begin with. Would you deny the triplets their mother? Their grandmother, Fanny, uh, as mother. Uh-huh. Nicholas Moore. Granted. Mrs. Kettleman. Oh, now, Dad, Mrs. Kettleman. Yes, Mrs. Kettleman. She's a tartar, a woman with a will of cast iron. No wonder her husband died a broken man. She beat him to death with her cast iron whip. <laughs> what a terrible thing to say. Well, she's not going to beat me down because my will is just as strong as hers. And I'll give her blow for blow from now until kingdom could. Well, I thought you and Mrs. Kelvin were beginning to like each other. How can you like a woman who walks around behind you with a broom sweeping her footprints off the living room floor as fast as you make them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, never mind about Mrs. Kettleman. I'll settle her. And now, I came here to ask you about Clifford, Claudia. Oh, he's my... He's all right. Huh? That's not what I mean, and you know it. Oh, but look, Dad... Hey, Paul, she's undoubtedly told you. Well, I don't think so, Dad. She didn't tell you that Clifford drove off in a big green convertible the other afternoon with a chit of a girl with flaming red hair? Well, well, that's so. That, you didn't know? No. At least you know her name by this time, Claudia. Oh, yes, Roberta Evans. Huh? Roberta Evans. That's all I know. Well... Didn't Clifford say anything? He said absolutely nothing, Dad. All he offered the next morning was her name. Just said, I suppose you're curious who the girl was who picked me up last night. Her name was Roberta Evans. And he walked out of the room. Was he out late with her? Dad, Clifford's a grown man. Besides, how would I know? Nicky and I went to bed at 10 o'clock and we both slept like tops. <laughs> and don't look so put out. Secrets, always secrets. I suppose it would kill somebody to tell me something once in a while. But I don't know, You'd Dad. You think I'd given birth to a whole nest full of deaf news? Oh, don't be unreasonable. Oh, I'm not unreasonable. Why should Clifford be sneaking off with a red-headed girl? May I suggest why? Well, do so. Same reason he's resentful towards the family. Same reason he didn't want to take his share of your and Mom's estate. 
Same reason he's down on me at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's rebellion. It's angered himself for not living up to what he thinks the family expects of him. He's trying to prove to himself that he can make a life for himself completely outside the family circle. Paul, I think you're very close to something. The big green convertible and the flashing red hair sounds in complete contrast to the pretty staid, conservative barber family. Flashy, daring, unconventional. He's choosing a girl as opposite to what the family stands for as he can find. Huh? You mean that girl's no better than she should be? But, Dad, please, I don't have the least knowledge of her. I'm just surmising. Well, I am not. I'm saying it. Roberta Evans is no better than she should be, and I may take it upon myself to tell Clifford so. Dad, no. I will. I'll tell him so in so many words. You've just heard Episode 7, Book 69 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. Chapter 8, entitled, Clifford Stands Up to His Father, will come to you tomorrow at this same time. One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present Chapter 13, Book 69, entitled The Payoff in the Clifford Story. devastating tragedies of Father Barber's life struck him full in the face a few minutes ago, he was down in his garden with a complete stranger, with Roberta Evans, the red-headed girl with the big green convertible. She drove the offending car, offending to Father Barber's eyes, that is, up before the family home, climbed out and came down into the garden to face the head of the house of Barber. You're Roberta Evans. Oh, you know me. I do. Oh, how nice. Then Clifford has talked to his family about me. Huh? You know, I was beginning to think there was either something the matter with me or else there was something dreadfully wrong with the Barber family. Clifford simply will never talk about his family and absolutely refuse to bring me near you. Impossible. Oh, what's that? How can you be the flippity gibbet with the red hair who drives around in that awful car with my son Clifford? <laughs> well, you can blame the red hair on me, but not the car. When I got my degree last summer, that was my father's present to me. Oh, you're not the kind of person I imagine at all. Uh, better or worse? You're older. Oh, no. Yes, you are. Seeing you flash by in that atrocious automobile, I'd have sworn you were not a day over 19. An adult painted fronting 19. <laughs> it must be the combination of the red hair and the green automobile. You suppose that's... I it? wouldn't believe it. You know I've been downright prejudiced against you. Well, I haven't been too happy about you either. Huh? Because Clifford kept me away, I thought maybe you were to blame. Anyway, I finally had to come over and find out the truth for myself. Well, how do you like these apples? Just what do you think's going on here, anyway? Clifford. Clifford, you're as white as a sheep. Well, I'm blazing inside, I can tell you that. Dad, you just can't keep out of my business, can you? Clifford. Clifford, how can you say such a thing to your father? Because that's how I feel. I can't even keep my own private love life out of the family scramble, family ties, grasping family hands reaching out. You're talking like an idiot, Clifford. You keep out of this. I came here of my own free will and because I wanted to. Your father didn't even know I was coming. She's a fine girl, Clifford. She's a fine girl. Well, she's not for me. Well, you hear that? She's not for me. Goodbye, all of you. Clifford, Clifford, come back here. What's wrong with him? I don't understand. What's the matter? Clifford, you hear me? Come back here. Clifford! Clifford! Come back! Oh, Mr. Barber, it isn't that bad. Please. Please, it's all right. It's just a tantrum. Please don't cry like that. Clifford will come back in a little while. Hey, what's going on? Dad, what's happened? What's the matter with him? Clifford was here a minute ago. And... Oh, doggone that guy, Clifford. <laughs> hey, Paul. Paul. Yeah, I'm coming. Here, Dad, it's all right. It's going to be okay. Your brother. Oh, I saw the whole thing in the street. Hey, now you come with me, Dad. That's it. Put your arm around my shoulder. I'll help. No, you stay here. We'll go in through the basement in the furnace room and get this out of our system. We want Mom, Mom to know about this. Don't go away, Miss Evans. If you wish. Well, what happened anyway? I never saw anything more terrible in my life. Clifford almost killed your father right here before my eyes. You mean he used his hands? No. The words he used. The tone of his voice. 
Please, I don't know who you are, but how could I have had any idea I was going to precipitate such a crisis just by coming here? You couldn't, and you probably didn't. It was bound to happen anyway. It's been leading up to it for weeks. You're Clifford's brother? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm Jack. Hey, where is Clifford anyway? He just jumped into my car and drove away. He did what? Yes, he he not only turned on your father, but he turned against me. (laughs) And then drove away in your automobile. Well, I'm glad you can see the humor in it. I didn't mean to be funny. I most sincerely hope he hasn't turned against you permanently. More important, I hope you haven't turned against him. I don't know. This hysteria in a man is something pretty appalling to me. I didn't bargain for anything like this in my life. Uh, was that your brother who came and got Mr. Barber? Yeah, that was Paul. Hey, come on inside. You ought to know Mom. Uh, please, no. After what's happened, I'm just a little bit terrified by the Barber's. And aren't you worried about Clifford? He drove off in a perfectly rabid frame of mind. Shouldn't we be doing something? Don't you think it'd be a good idea to let him get it out of the system? I don't know what we can do about your car until he brings it back. I don't think you realize what a blind rage he was in. I don't think he'll damage your car. I'm not thinking about my car. I'm thinking about Clifford. You're really interested in Cliff, aren't you? That's not the point. Well, we're getting just a little fed up with Cliff's antics. This is no worse than he's been acting. Don't you care what happens to him? Look, that's the first time in my life I ever saw my father really cry. Clifford did that to him. It's just about the limit as far as I'm concerned. I I think I'd like to go home. Paul asked you to stay. I can always be reached. I don't want to be here anymore. Okay, I'll drive you. No, I'll go down to the drugstore and call a cab. Now, don't be silly. I'll take you home and I'll see you get your car back. Come on, I'll just drop into the basement and tell Paul and then we'll get on our way. Oh, then that's better, Dad. You just sit there and listen to me. Here, you need a clean handkerchief. <laughs> You know, it's a funny thing about parents. I don't care whether they're parents of grown sons and daughters, or parents of teenagers, or of infant children. They're all the same. They're always worrying, blaming themselves, full of fears, full of misgivings, feeling guilty of both the sins of omission and commission, so far as their children are concerned. When they're little ones, the parents are fearful lest they don't give the child every opportunity for becoming a good, upright citizen. And when the child has grown, the parent still isn't satisfied. Always he's asking himself, wherein have I failed? What did I do which has hindered him from becoming the man he might have been? What could I have done which I did not do? Ah, uh, how parents yearn to become the all-wise, the all-knowing guardian angel. And how far short they all fall. All of them. Because, as the saying is, it is human to err. And the flesh is weak. And the spirit is confused in all of us. Here, take a little drink of water. Lean back. Hmm? Yes. But the thing parents seem to forget is that each child is a person, an individual. What parents won't remember is that they're not owners of their children, that they actually have no proprietorship in their offspring. No, they're simply the instrument through which another individual as independent as they themselves is brought into the world. Of course, they have the stewardship of protecting and helping that child until he is able to help himself. Parents have the privilege of opening a child's eyes to truth and knowledge and human relationships. Oh, yes, they have the privilege, but they don't have the right to force either knowledge or truth or ethics or the humanities on a child. In fact, you can't. No one can force any ideas or ideals or form of thinking or way of life onto a child. He can be led, he can be persuaded, but he cannot be made to say or do or think what he's not willing to say or to think, or what he's incapable of saying, doing, or thinking. He... Oh, Jack. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Miss Evans wants to be taken home. Oh? I'm going to take her. I don't know where she lives, but I'll be back as soon as I can. Yeah. Anything I can do, Dad? No, no. There's nothing, Jack. Yeah, well, I'll be back as soon as I can. In the case of Clifford, Dad, there apparently is something deep within him which will not fully and wholly accept the barber's conception of family life. Nor will he accept you as lord and master of the family. Not even as the figurehead, the symbol of family authority. This isn't something which has just now come to pass. It's been in him from the very beginning of his life. Perhaps it has something to do with him being one of twins. Perhaps because his twin Claudia was a girl was quicker in developing as girls are apt to do. Or maybe just because she was a girl and received a more generous amount of love and affection. 
which sometimes happens in a family. Perhaps it had nothing at all to do with his twinship. I couldn't say, but whatever the fundamental problem is, it began in his very young life and lay there in his unconscious of bitter seed, waiting for some proper time to send out roots deep into his gall and his bile and to send out tendrils of haunting guilt, dreadful insecurity, feelings of shame and self-debasement to tantalize his mind. And now, the seed of his youth, which grew into the strangling vine in early manhood, has finally brought forth its flower of neurotic, unreasoning violence. And how is anyone to blame? Who is wise enough or far-seeing enough to have known what Clifford felt as an infant or how that feeling was going to react? Only a trained specialist could have known. And in that time, there were no trained specialists in child psychology. No, Dad, I know you're sitting there saying over and over, what have I done? How could I have gone so far wrong with one of my children? And it's not true. Clifford is a man. He's an individual who, through circumstances, has found himself lost in the great wilderness of his own uncontrollable emotions. The mind and the body. Who knows the whole answer? But I do know this. There's no blame on you. No blame on you and no blame on Mom. Believe me, not any. Hours have gone by. No word from Clifford or the missing green convertible. Jack, having returned from taking Roberta Evans home, has even tried calling the Sky Ranch. And now in the family living room... He didn't go to the Sky Ranch, then. Nicky says no sign of him. You honestly worried, Paul? Not until you told me what Miss Evans said. You got her home all right? Yeah. You mean Cliff being in a white-hot rage? Yeah, a fit of desperation. I don't know. I think we'd better call... Oh, Hazel, I'm glad you're here. Well, what's all this? Father sitting in the library as though he'd lost his last friend, you two conspiring over the telephone? Hazel, Clifford jumped in Roberta Evans' car about an hour ago when she came to see Dad and drove off like a madman. With a girl? No, just left her standing. He left Dad in tears, and Miss Evans says he was completely out of control. But why? Because Miss Evans came here and got in touch with the family. I was so worried about Dad in the beginning. I've been with him all this time, but suddenly it occurred to Did me... Did Mother that... know about any of this? No, she... I did call a Sky Ranch. He didn't go there. Oh, please, don't say anything to her. It's upsetting the father. To... Here, I'll take it. The barber residence. This is Paul Barber speaking. Who's this? Oh? I have a brother, Clifford Barber. What? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, what is it? Yeah, right away. Right now. Paul, what's the matter? The big green convertible missed the Spring Valley Lake Bridge out on the Skyline Boulevard. Dived into 20 feet of water. Oh, no. Well, Cliff, what about Cliff? He was thrown clear in the San Mateo City Emergency Hospital. I'm on my way down there. Call Dr. Thompson, Hazel. Jack, you stand by here and see that nobody knows about this. Nobody. Well, what about him? Is he dead or alive? They don't take a dead man to an emergency hospital, do they? How do I know? You just stay here and help Hazel keep the family from knowing anything like I get back. Uh, Paul, what's the matter? Where are you going in such a tearing hurry? Oh, hello, Dan. Excuse me, I've got an emergency down at the flying field. I'll see you at dinner. Emergency? Jack, Hazel, what kind of an emergency? Down at the airfield, huh? I don't believe it. You're keeping something from me. No one ever tells me anything. just heard episode 13, book 69 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. Chapter 1, book 70, entitled The Worst That Could Happen, will come to you Monday at this same hour. 